My name is Bill Elliott. I'm from a, a family that's really well known locally, nationally, for uh, singing songs about the mines. And they're telling their stories because five generations of my family were coal miners at the same colliery, uh, Harriton Colliery, in what we consider to be Washington. So I was raised in a mining family. Um, I went to a, a tiny little junior school in those days in Fatfield. And I had a, a wonderful childhood there and eventually uh, passed the 11 plus and went to Washington Grammar School. And I have a, a real affinity with Washington because of very, very happy childhood days and school days. In 1964, I was still living in a, a mining house in old Fatfield Village uh, called Waterside Terrace. There were four houses in that terrace. Uh, no bathroom, no inside toilet. Uh, so that's not the fondest of memories, but nevertheless. So the, the toilet and the coal house were in the garden. And right at the end of the garden, uh, the end of the garden where the fence was, the river Weir was. So it was right at the bottom of our garden. Um, and in 1964, I had been at Washington Grammar School for two years. Um, was enjoying it, uh, was getting involved in all kinds of different things there. But I was still, if you like, able to enjoy the area I lived in in terms of uh, play. I was 11, 12, uh, still went down to Worm Hill and played around there. I spent hours at Worm Hill, uh, Fatfield Burn, the woods, the wagon way. Um, things were still... In childhood days, were still kind of seasonal. So we played football in the, the winter. I played tennis, cricket in the summer. Went looking for conkers, all that kind of thing. I, I would sum up my childhood days up to that point. Very, very happy. Had a great time. Loved it. It was a great place to be. There were no cars. Nobody had a car. So in terms of safety, uh, you were fine. Um Mom threw me out of the house with the other two because she was busy. And that's the way it was. You know, you spent hours and hours and hours outside. Uh, and I got involved in sport at school, so I was busy doing that, representing the school. So I had a very, very active life. Uh, but also, um, I was fully aware of the music side of the family because uh, we all had to gather, whether we liked it or not. <laughs> and Graham was on a Sunday afternoon. It was a kind of royal command. And uh, so I was exposed to listening to the family sing from a very, very early age. And that kind of continued uh, until, obviously, uh, Granda passed away and what have you. So those kind of memories uh, will never leave me. It was a uh, very, very happy time. Um, lots of music and lots of different kinds of music to listen to with my granddad. He very, had a very eclectic taste, um, opera, um, blues, um, old time music and obviously folk songs from the, the locale so yeah happy days fantastic actually uh, you've mentioned uh, grandma and granddad now uh, can you tell us a little bit more about them because obviously I know who your grandma and granddad were but well uh, grandma was M M Elliot uh, granddad was Jack Elliot um, they were a couple whose first domicile was one of the Belgian huts in Burton. So the Belgian referee, uh, refugees in the Great War had their own place in Burton called Elizabethville. And when most of the Belgians went back home, not all of them did, but some of them did, Granda and Grandma's first dwelling was one of the Belgian huts. And then they got their own house. Uh, and the one I remember, of course, is Seven Browns Buildings. It's significant to me because I was born in Seven Brown's Buildings <laughs> in the front room on the 22nd of September, 1950s, and I was their first grandchild. Um, but it was a great place to be. Lots of fun, lots of laughter. Um, very serious at times, but not when I was kind of present at, you know, early years, as it were. But uh, just fun. Um, my lasting kind of image of Grandma is a book in one hand and a cigarette in the other. 
everybody smoked. That the the house was full of smoke. Everybody smoked. Um, but happy days and cards. They played cards continuously. Cribbage. Grandma and granddad used to play cribbage. Uh, I got taught how to play cribbage by my grandma. Um, but just the house was always kind of full of people, you know. Um, and of course, some very important people later on in uh, 1961, when we had uh, Ewan McCall and Peggy Seeger. Um, not quite resident there, but spending hours there recording not just the immediate family, um, relatives, uh, and they recorded hours and hours and hours of uh, stories, songs, uh, about all kinds of aspects of mining life, um, street songs, school songs, you name it. It just reflected all the experiences of the, the close family and the wider network, and that became uh, the Elliot's of Berkeley LP. I mean, the, the journey into that kind of folk world had already begun. And it, because of the links with the folk music uh, movement in the Northeast, that LP came about. The, the key person was Johnny Handel, who was obviously a founder member of the Bridge Folk Club, uh, which my grandfather and my uncle Peter used to go to. The link was then made with the BBC, who did the radio ballads. Um, several of which were made late 50s, early 60s. And the one that my grandfather and Uncle Reese got involved in was obviously the great, the big human. But uh, the link was Johnny Handel. And because the link had been made with the BBC, Charles Parker, the producer of the, uh, the radio ballads, the link was made with Ewan McCall and Peggy. And then the LP got made because they obviously became friends. They liked each other. And uh, so that's how it came about. Berkeley Folk Club was started the year after that LP was created, 1962. And so that whole kind of movement they became part of. I mean, they weren't the prime movers, but they, they had their part to play. The bridge was the key player in the early days. You know, 1958, the bridge was established Lots of people went there, and from that, other folk clubs were created. Mm -hmm. And the Northeast had its folk scene, which was really uh, vibrant and strong. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember visiting quite a lot of them when I was a child. Mm -hmm. I remember being smuggled into the bridge, aged 14, <laughs> to perform <clears throat> with the fam. And they did that many times. Mm -hmm. But no, it, it was a kind of... Uh, grandma was the gaffer. Without doubt, she was about four foot ten, eleven. Granda was six foot odd. Um, but uh, when she spoke, we all listened. And her her story is interesting uh, because she was a domestic servant yeah. in her youth before she met me, Granda. And because she was in that environment, I think it was a, a wealthy doctor. She observed table manners and how people addressed each other and manners, and that was definitely handed on to us, whether we liked it or not. Mm -hmm. So we, we knew about good manners. And to be honest with you, you that's still something I noticed the first time I meet people, their mm -hmm. manners. And I think it's very important. And we were told how to sit up straight, elbows in, the whole thing when you're, when you're dining. And that's never left me. And I think I probably passed it on to mine. Uh, and yeah. So mm -hmm. very fond memories of my childhood. There was a lot of laughter. I mean, uh, you know, my granddad was a really good storyteller. And I don't think that any of the Elliots you would describe as being shy and retiring. No, stop laughing. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's your, your grandma and your granddad and obviously Harriton's kind of in that sort of it's almost that no man's land isn't it between Washington and Berkeley that's right and so, um, what about your dad and uh, how did you end up in Fatfield well my dad uh, didn't start his working life in the pit mm -hmm. uh, he was very strongly encouraged by Granda to get a trade mm -hmm. now Granda didn't have a, a skilled trade per se he was a skilled miner 
Mm. You, you know, he worked at the face and all that kind of thing, but not a designated, recognised trade. So Dad did his uh, apprenticeship at Sigmund Pumps, which was on the Team Valley, and he became a fitter and turner. Mm. And we lived my first years. Uh, my mum's from Gateshead, <clears throat> and they met each other, my dad and my mum met at a dance, which was the way you met in the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, my dad apparently was a good dancer. Despite my name, Billy Elliot, I haven't <laughs> picked up any skills in that, <laughs> in that way. So uh, yeah, apparently they met at a dance. Uh, their first domicile, uh, when I was around, was in Gateshead. They lived with my mum's dad. And then the opportunity to get a job at Harriton uh, came up. By the way, Harriton was always referred to as caution, caution pit, because uh, there were so many Scots who had come down to work there. They broke the bond by leaving uh, Scotland because it was the bond was almost like slavery. Mm -hmm. So they came down to work in down here, and because Scotland is sometimes referred to as Nova Scotia. Then it got shortened to kosher, and it was known as kosher pit, you know, by a lot of people. In fact, uh, I kind of remember that, you know, does, does your dad work at kosher? Yeah, not Harriton. Mm. And that's the way it was. So dad uh, started working there, I think, in about 58. So I was about seven or eight, and we moved to the pit house, Waterside Terrace in Fatfield where we stayed till about 1960, late 1964, 1965. Then we moved, believe it or not, in the same street as where my grandma lives, which is what people tended to do. Uh, so Brown's Buildings, 26 Brown's Buildings was a, our next domicile. Um, so, and he worked there uh, until the pit closed in '65. Is it your dad that's in um, Death of a Miner where he's been, he's taken yes. the producer around the, the remains of the pit? Yeah. They were actually demolishing it at the time. So when you see him being interviewed, you can actually hear explosions. The, the, the pit was officially closed in 65. It was demolished in 66, 67. Um, Grandad passed away in 66. Um, so it would be 67 when they started the actual demolition. But my dad took them to what was left at that time. So some of the officers were still there, despite the fact they were kind of just strewn with rubbish and, and what have you. So he took them round to show them what was left of the pit and a little bit of history about the pit, the fact that it had been there for 300 years. So it was a long established colliery because working life of pits varied. You know, some of them didn't last that long at all, probably because of the coal had been worked, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but Harriton was certainly 300 years old when he finally, you know, departed, as it were. Yeah. How, what was the feeling in the family about the, the pit going? Because I, I <clears> get this ambivalence. Nobody really wanted that kid to go down a pit. Well, but I think it's that kind of um, feeling was reflected in the film by my aunt, Auntie Doreen, who was an interesting character, as you know, um, when she said that, and Dad said that as well, in the, in the first film they made, The Death of a Mind is a compilation. The first film was called Private Lives, which was made in 61, and that obviously had Granda involved and had discussions in my grandma's kitchen, which was headquarters for political discussion. And they were talking about village life, the pit, and how the pit is the focal point of the community. So if the pit's doing well, the community's doing well, because everybody's livelihood's attached to it. So it, when the pit closed, my auntie Dorian reflected that she worried it was going to be the end of not just the pit, the community, the, my dad said, if you're not all focused on the well-being of the pit, you will have different employment. So, and as he said, if you're doing all right but somebody else isn't, well, that's the way it is, where once upon a time, everybody's fortunes were linked to the pit. And she, Andy Dorian, reflected on that when it closed that it was probably going to be very, very different 
way of life for people because you had all this divergence in terms of, you know, employment. And I think she's probably right. Mm -hmm. I was only 15. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it wasn't something that I talked about continuously mm -hmm. because I was doing other things and, you know, I was, I was a 15-year-old. But it certainly got talked about. Mm -hmm. Not that I was excluded from any kind of discussion. Dad and I used mm -hmm. to talk. And Dad was um, like very like my grandfather. Mm -hmm. um, always try to see the funny side of things, even when it was like a serious... He did have a serious side, like my grandfather. And if it meant something to him and it was a, something about principle, then you knew exactly where he stood. But he, mm -hmm. he did kind of laugh at life. That's definitely the pairing. Granda and Dad, I think, were very similar in terms of character and the way they dealt with things. I mean, it was a really, really hard job. Mm -hmm. And um, Granda was in a roof for He survived it because he was trapped by his legs. Um, but he was hurt down the pit. Uh, he hurt his back. He was off work for two years. He went through the 26th strike, which definitely kind of resonated with him for the rest of his life. Both of them, Grandma as well. Yeah. I mean, that, that little bit from the film where she talks about being so hungry mm. and scrapping around, as she said, to find a hate me because Heron were being sold for five for a pen and she could only find a hate me. And then cooking the Heron in water because I had no fat and hers declaring that it was the most delicious meal she's ever had because they were starving. So all of that it never left them. You know, I don't think we can leave you. Yeah. But yeah, that, that shaped their lives and it certainly shaped their offspring in terms of political views, uh, kind of views on social mores, etc. I mean, we were taught very, very early on what was right and what was wrong. Mm. And that never left us. And that was how to treat people as well. Be yourself, but don't do anything at the cost of somebody else. Mm. And I think that's resonated with me as well. That's brilliant. So... I'm just thinking that you were kind of in these two worlds, uh, the world that looked back to the 1926 strike mm. and the, uh, the pit village and all the rest of it, and then you're in the, the grammar school in mm. what's becoming a new town. And You know, how, how did that fit? It was, <clears throat> I think, at my time uh, at school and in uh, when I moved to Barley Mow, I still went to Washington Grammar School. There were scholars' buses. Mm -hmm. That took us there. And we had people from Chesley Street who went to Washington Grammar School at the start of their uh, secondary. I, I never understood that because Chesley Street had a grammar school. So I could never figure that out. So I continued at the grammar school. Um, but Washington New Town, per se, I really didn't have an understanding of it because it, when, it, when it was first thought of, proposed, all that kind of thing, I was in my like late teens, so it wasn't something I was very conscious of. I'd moved away from Fatfield, so I lived in Barley Mow. Um, my first uh, job, if you want to call it a job, when I left school, was to be a professional footballer for Darlington FC for a whole year. And then they said, go away. So... <laughs> Uh, and I worked in a bank for six months in Chesley Street, uh, which I didn't like, uh, didn't suit me, and I got sacked for refusing to get me haircut. I thought it was Roger Daltrey, Jude. Yeah. <laughs> You've seen the girls. I've seen the photos. Yeah. So, and I wasn't fussed about that. Mm -hmm. And then eventually I headed off to Merseyside in 1971. So when the new town itself was really going getting some momentum, I was away. You know, I still heard about it, obviously, because Dad eventually moved uh, into one of the new villages, Coca. Um, so I wasn't really in the area when it was really kind of taken off. But I did see the kind of outcome of it, because I used to obviously come back from Liverpool. I spent 15 years down there. Mm. I came back in 1986. But coming to visit Dad... Mm -hmm. in Corkett or when it was district whatever it was 
was a nightmare for me. Mm. I think I, I went 26 different ways to his house because I couldn't figure out where I was compared to what it, I was used to. You know, because when I was a child, uh, in teens, um, Harrington Colliery or Kosher had its cricket pitch, which is still there. That's one of the surviving things of that colliery, the, the cricket pitch. And I knew where I was in the old days, but trying to find places when it changed was a struggle for me. You know, it yeah. still is. I'm not sure where, you know, when people use the village terms, I'm thinking, well, where, where's that? And, but uh, I'm a bit more used to it now, mm. I'll put it that way. Uh, and one of the kind of things I remember about old Washington mm. was the fact that uh, I spent many, many happy hours uh, in the unofficial sixth form, which was known as the Washington Norms. <laughs> And uh, Spout Lane, the, the steps and all that kind of thing. That that was when I was like late teens. Mm -hmm. I've got very, very fond memories of my uh, days in Washington. So the steps at Spout Lane. Yeah. The ex uh, can you tell me more about them? Well, I can tell you my introduction to illicit beer drinking. Mm -hmm. I, I, when I got into sixth form, I played for the senior boys team. That was like upper and lower sixth. And one Saturday morning, you played on Saturday morning, so the lads who were up at six, who were 18, my birthday is September, September 22nd, so I was one of the older kids in, in the year group. So then he said, come on, I'll take you for a pint. And I went, right. So <laughs> I went in the steps, which is just down from the old grammar school, and uh, I had a pint shandy, dude, pint shandy. When I got in, I... Mummy's first words, you've been drinking. <laughs> what? Pint shandy. So, yes, so I was Different detected mm. and uh, told off. And then, okay, so I'd be wary. But the, the steps was great. Mm -hmm. Lovely little pub. Mm -hmm. um, but as I say, you know, um, most of the lads were, were 18, so weren't breaking the law. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Washington Arms, I've got very, very fond memories of, like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I hit 18, which was the start of me up a sixth, we'd see teachers in there, you know, we would socialise, well, not in their company, but we'd say hello, and it was fine, you know, it, it, that was okay. And I've got very fond memories of my last year at school because we had a fantastic football team, brilliant football team, uh, and we won the National Schools Trophy, and that was something in those days because we uh, in the open rounds which is like once you've qualified as Durham champions we played every single round away and that increased my awareness of other places so we played uh, Ashington which is not that far away beat them the Northumberland champions then we travelled to Liverpool Merseyside beat their champions and then we travelled across the Mersey in the next round to Ellesmere Port. And in the semi-final, we played against Luton Sixth Form College at Luton Townsend. And we qualified for the final. And we played a two-legged final. The first leg was at Walker Park, the old Sunderland ground. And we beat them 5-1 at Walker Park. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to score a couple of the goals. Um, but we did hear that the lads from Plymouth were really good lads and we, we talked to them, we had dinner with them after the meal uh, and then we went down to Plymouth for the second leg, stayed overnight and we beat them 2-1 down there so we became national champions but the lads from Plymouth divulged to us that when they arrived in Sunderland it was an overnight stay they'd gone out and discovered Newcastle Brown Hill <laughs> That might have affected the performance <laughs> on the Saturday morning, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. so we were national champions. And bear in mind where we are, one of the rewards for that was we were given a tea in Washington Old Hall by the councillors. We were celebrated in that way. So the team were given a special tea in Washington Old Hall. The final at Walker Park was May the 12th, 1969. And when we came back from Plymouth, 
which we all had a magnificent night that night, I can tell you, because one of our brethren was referenced in the assembly in the, the school when we got back. He was one of the younger members of the team and had spent two hours going up and down in the lift all night <laughs> because he was slightly inebriated. Small pleasures. Yes. He's now, well, was a teacher, but uh, he was referenced by the head teacher in the assembly that nobody could get in the lift because of said person. But no, that was that was a great time for me because uh, you build when you play team games like that, you, you build up lifelong friendships. Mm -hmm. And let me see, five years ago we had a fifty-year reunion of the team, or as many as we could get in touch with in the Washington Arms with our teacher who lives just around the corner from here. So that was nice. That's we brilliant. there weren't many of us, but it was great to relive. You know what we went through. There were strong bonds, and we had a we had a really good football team. Several of which went on to be professional footballers, mm -hmm. not lifelong careers, but they definitely experienced it, and it was great. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but I've got kind of three passions. Music's obviously one of them. Sport is another. That's still very. I became a PE teacher, mm -hmm. and uh, I think kind of the mining heritage. I'm very, very determined to do as much as I can, wherever I can, to preserve that. I'm very proud of it. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. There's kind of a crossover as well, isn't there? Because you work on the um, the Calls to Goals project. Yeah. And, uh, I remember you talking about the way that Washington's got this kind of weird, divided loyalty. <laughs> Football-wise? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, when I was at school... Um, it was about 60-40 in favour of Sunderland in terms of allegiances. Now, that was at school. Barley Mow, where I lived, was probably the other way around uh, because you're on that, the A1 to Newcastle, etc. But several of the lads that I was at school played for Sunderland despite the fact they supported Newcastle. But in those days, Jude, it was it was healthy banter. It was mm -hmm. joking and little, you know, jokes. There wasn't this, and it, that's true. There was not this kind of, you know, nasty animosity that was there now. Mm -hmm. um, it just wasn't like that. It used to take the mic. All my friends, all of my close group of friends, were some that supporters. And I went to see them where I went to see Newcastle because of the women mates. Mm -hmm. So I went, went down to places like Burnley. I went down to... Uh, now, why would you go... To, anyway, never mind. <laughs> so, and then we went to places like uh, Old Trafford, mm -hmm. Manchester, with them because they were from Shiny Row, Shiny Ra, and Pension. All of my friends were from that part of the, uh, the world. But mm -hmm. they were classmates, teammates, and that's the way it was, yeah. you know? So... I always want all of the teams to do well. Mm. I'll put it that way. I, I really mean that. Not when they're playing each other, but I would like to see the world do as well as they can. That's, That's the way I was raised, you know. And funny yes. enough, one of my ex-pupils is now the manager of Middlesbrough, Michael Carr. Uh, I used to teach him in Wall's End. Yeah. Wow. So there you go. Amazing. Loving that. You're talking about former classmates, and I know he was sort of like a few years above you and all the rest of it, but I've got to ask about Brian Ferry. <laughs> Brian Ferry was uh, in the upper sixth when I arrived. Uh, so I didn't know him socially. I knew who he was because he was one of the kind of iconic figures in the school. He was uh, very tall, very dark, and the first time I ex knew exactly who he was, was he was Malvolio in Twelfth Night. And he played that role on stage in the school play. And we went to see it. Mm -hmm. So that was my first kind of, oh, that's Brian Ferry. The music side of things, uh, I'm not sure he was involved that much then. I think he probably was. But he also represented the school at football, Jude. He was the goalkeeper for his year group. <laughs> Probably because of his size. I don't know about his skills, yeah. but he played with somebody who became very, very famous in terms of British football, Howard Kendall, 
who went on to manage Everton, play for Everton, manage Everton, and was one of the most successful Everton managers. Well, he was a teammate of Brian Ferry. And there's a picture of him on Raggy Spelk uh, website mm-hmm. of the Washington teams from that time. <clears throat> but he did come back to our school mm-hmm. for, we used to have dancers in the sixth form. I think one of the first bands he ever had when he went to Newcastle Arts College was the Jazz Board. I think that was their name. Mm-hmm. So they obviously had that play on words of Gasper or Gasper Jazz Board. So I think he's, one of his first loves was jazz or that kind of oriented style of music. So anyway, they came to play for the the, the dance that we had in the sixth form. So he came back to his uh, his alma mater. How interesting. Yeah. Good. I like Brian Ferry, mind. I like, mm-hmm. uh, I love Roxy music. Mm-hmm. And I went to see him in Liverpool mm-hmm. uh, when it was just Brian Ferry. Uh and it was a great night. Um, but it, one of the funniest things was when uh, my wife and I were lining up to go in. I'd been given the tickets, but somebody got them and couldn't make it. So we got two tickets to see Brian Ferry. And it was Tokyo Joe. It was that kind of era with the big saxes and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I was in the queue. And we just waited to go in. And I heard, all right, see. <laughs> oh, no. So it was one of the kids <clears throat> was there. I think they were like in the sixth form or something. So I was witnessed going into a Brian Ferry concert. And that was a really great night. It was the Philharmonic Hall in Liverpool, which is fabulous. Mm-hmm. Brilliant place. That's where you had your graduation from the college I went to. Um, but I've got fond, very fond memories of Liverpool as well, Jude. Yeah. Brilliant city. Great place to be. My kids were born there as well. Mm-hmm. And of course, the Elliott family came down uh, to play at the folk club I was involved in, mm-hmm. in Liverpool, because Liverpool had a very strong folk music scene uh, in the early 70s. It was one of those places mm-hmm. where you didn't just have a folk club each night. You had a choice. There was that many folk clubs knocking about. The Spinners obviously had theirs. The Liverpool Trad Club was the one I got involved in, uh, which was brilliant. And you had people like Mary Black's brother, Shea Black, was a resident. And I met uh, lots of folks down there who kind of, you know, I wouldn't say inspired me, but certainly kind of I really enjoyed their playing and how they kind of perceived the music and what have you. So much to the point that we actually formed a folk club with lots of folks who used to be at the Trad Club became a resident of one near where I lived. And I lived right next to Penny Lynn in Liverpool. And I have to tell you, Jude, the street sign lasted a fortnight at, at best. Somebody would always be yeah. removing it because of its significance. And Strawberry Hills was Strawberry Fields was just not far, which is a park. And John Lennon's school, Quarry Bank, where he formed the quarry men. That was around the corner from where I lived. So the heritage part of Liverpool is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the family came down and performed at uh, the full club we ran. And during the 84 strike, they came down to play at a fundraising concert organised by the Liverpool Trade Union Movement at the Neptune Theatre. And that was a sun night. That was so emotional. I mean, Liverpool doesn't have any minds. But you're not too far away from the Lancashire cool field. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you had that strong link with the Lanx miners, like St. Helens and places like that. Um, and they performed with the band I was involved in at the Neptune Theatre. And it was a fantastic night. And as I said to you earlier, um, there was a young married couple there at the interval when people were, you know, trying to raise money. They donated their honeymoon savings to the course and my auntie Dorian was so moved she announced that from the stage and the the applause was just amazing Mm -hmm. so it was a great night and it was great to have all my family come down to Liverpool you know which was a special night Mm -hmm. special special night was it strange observing what was going on in the coal fields at at a remove yeah yeah Mm -hmm. because 
Um, <clears throat> I think if you were working up here, like a good friend of ours, Kath Connor, mm. now she was a teacher at Rosebury uh, Secondary School. I often wondered what it must have been like in places in Durham where you had tensions within the community, if you had uh, striking minors, their children going to school with non-striking minors, how that kind of played out in lessons, in the yard, in the community. I didn't witness that because I wasn't here, but it, it struck me as to that must have been really difficult at times. Mm -hmm. And people like Kath might have experienced that, I don't know. But it must have been... I mean, I've seen a lot of programmes recently about the 84 strike, mm -hmm. um, about how it affected communities, specifics like old grief and what have you. But no, I, it must have been really, really tough. Yeah. It, it's an interesting thought. It's something we need to follow up, I think, because also round about that era, um, Washington is interested in bringing in Nissan. Yep. And so like you're getting the old industry replaced by the new mm -hmm. and a more internationalised world. I think it's, it's a very interesting sort of period, right? the early yeah. 1980s. I think one of the things uh, that struck me as well was obviously um, with the new town coming, the fact that old Fatfield was wiped out, mm. you know, where I lived, disappeared. The back-to-backs, Castle Street, gone. Um, and obviously the the declaration that it was a Category D had a huge impact on the village where I lived. Everything I was familiar with, the shops, the house I lived in, the school I went to, gone. Mm -hmm. you know, there's very few landmarks left from my childhood days. I'm actually thinking quite a few people listening probably don't know what the Category D villages were, so in the detail would be great. Well, I'm not exactly sure. This is not my strength, but basically I think what the... And Durham wasn't the only area in the country that had Category D declared upon certain villages. I think basically it was, well, almost... I'm not an expert on it, but I think, well... <clears throat> This life has gone. Uh, it's not worth keeping development here at all. In fact, what we need to do is get rid of the old and bring in the new, whatever that is. So the old meant the old houses, the old industry, the old um, shops, the co-op, all that kind of thing, which was a big part of my life, just were got rid of. And now most of Fatfield, as I know it, is... Greenland, it's parks, it's, uh, you know, places to walk. There's there's nothing left from my time in the particular part of Fatby where I live, apart from North Billy Club. Uh -huh. That's still there, mm -hmm. where apparently Mummy said Daddy spent far too much time getting rid of the dust, I think. Yeah, that's it. I mean, Worm Hill's obviously still there mm -hmm. and always will be. Um, but in terms of buildings... Harrington Welfare, I think, was there. It certainly was, 1935, so mm -hmm. that's there. But landmarks, for me, they've gone. You know, they really have. When did you move back to the North East? 1986. 1986. Uh, summer term, 1986. Uh, I got a job. I was ready to come back. Mm -hmm. uh, I had two children. One was about to start school. The other one nearly three. Uh, well, I had no family in Liverpool. Uh, obviously, I had friends, but they were all working. So in terms of family support, uh, there wasn't any. So we decided that... Uh, my wife was a primary teacher. We decided the time was right to come back to the North East. Uh, so I managed to get the job in Wall's End. And then she came back. Uh, she got a job eventually teaching uh, in primary schools. So it was 1986, and I worked at Burnside School in Wall's End, which was the old uh, Wall's End Grammar School. 
building yeah. where good friends of mine used to go. Stuart Luckley, for instance, he's a Wall's End lad, mm-hmm. and Walter Fairburn, brilliant musicians, so they, they were Wall's End lads. Uh, and I had 25 years there, and I, I enjoyed it. Too. I like I liked where I was. Uh, the people were, you know, good people. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, the school I was in was an old school, because part of the buildings were the old grammar school buildings. There was a 60s kind of comp where they became one. But um, it was probably the school that represented Wall's End itself, Wall's End Town. Mm-hmm. So the most of the people had lived there a long time. And obviously the traditional industries, Swan Hunter, mm-hmm. shipbuilding. We still had lads leaving in 86 going into Swans. Mm-hmm. Now that didn't last very long. But you still had the traditional industries on the time. Mm-hmm. So that was... Didn't last much longer than '86, but lads still went there mm-hmm. to Swan Hunters and uh, other kind of shipbuilding or ship repairs or whatever. That was still vibrant then. Yeah, it's it's really interesting, isn't it, to think that there were these industries that were synonymous with with this area to a large extent, and yeah. they're just not there now. Gone. Yeah, and I think once upon a time the old grammar school Swan Hunters. Mm. Apprentices, uh, draftsmen, mm-hmm. spent time there because there was a room there which they used. So there was a strong link between the old grammar school and Swan Hunters. Mm-hmm. Um, because, well, you could walk from the school to Swan Hunters in about half an hour. Mm-hmm. It's right on the doorstep, you know. That's just made me think what, when you were at Washington Grammar, mm-hmm. what was the expected occupation? For somebody at Washington Grammar. Well, you you had within the grammar school you still had divisions because you still had a lot of people leave after all levels mm-hmm. who went off to do apprenticeships and stuff like that or work. Mm-hmm. Whereas you had a the minority would stay on and do A levels. And obviously they were destined for higher education, uh, whatever format that took. A lot of teachers. Mm-hmm. Ended up, you know, from like cat, you know, mm-hmm. from grammar school education, but not all. I mean, some went into banking, uh, so it wasn't necess- It wasn't absolute that you went into higher ed. Mm-hmm. You might go into certain jobs at a certain level, um, but a lot of folks went into higher ed, whatever that meant mm-hmm. in terms of their studies, their degrees, whatever. Quite a few teachers mm-hmm. ended up, you know, because of Washington grammar school. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Were you aware the kids at the secondary moderns? Do you know something? It was very strange, dude. Mm. In the little village of Fatfield, <clears throat> where nearly everybody started working at the pit, seven of us passed the 11 plus in the year I passed, which was 62. And once you passed the 11 plus, you became a grammar snob. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Labelled thus. Yeah. And it was very odd. Because people you'd been to school with for like three or four years, because you went to the grammar school, and that system was the tripartite system. So you had the modern, secondary modern grammar school. That's that was the order. Mm-hmm. So if you failed the eleven plus all of it, you went to the modern school, which was next door to the junior school I went to, right next door. Yeah. Not a huge amount of people went there, but that's where you went. That was your destination. Mm-hmm. The secondary one, mm-hmm. where it was probably the Glebe School uh-huh. <clears throat> for people who went to Fatfield, and then the Grammar School, which obviously was uh, up the road at Spoutley. So you, you had that kind of division already, you know. Mm-hmm. People who did well at secondary mod with their O levels, because you sat all levels at secondary mm-hmm. mod, then they would come to the Grammar School to do their A levels. So we had people come from Bolton Colliery, um, secondary mod, to do their A levels at the school, <clears throat> but that's that's the way it was. Yeah, but it was really odd, you know, grandma snob. Yeah, I'm your mate. <laughs> what happened? Yeah. But when we when we came to do, you sat the first part of the eleven plus in your school, mm-hmm. and then you sat the second part in the grammar school, and I remember I got a lift. 
in the car of the main manager because his son was sitting there as well, Fred Humble. And uh, I was taken to my 11 plus in the car for the first time ever. But it was the manager's car. Oh, wow. <laughs> so we didn't have a car. Yeah. Nobody had a car. That's an interesting thing as well, isn't it? Because before 1964, people didn't usually have cars. No. And then you get to the new town, which is built on a presumption of yeah. car ownership. Yeah. Um, our f- my mode of transport to the grammar school was a 39 bus, mm-hmm. which you got from the bridge, Pension Bridge, uh, or Fatfield Bridge, whatever side you're on. Uh, and then that took me to school, stopped right outside school. There wasn't a scholar's bus, mm-hmm. there was the service bus, the 39. Um, my dad's first kind of family transport for us, which always brings a smile to our face, it was a motorbike and sidecar. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you were there? Three. And our our holidays were <laughs> Sandy Bay in Northumberland, Caravan Park, mm-hmm. which we thought was the other side of the world. Mm-hmm. And our daddy's navigational skills were shocking. Mm-hmm. None of us had got good navigation. He was terrible. We went to South Shields Beach seven different ways. <laughs> and had a cup of tea and then came home. He was hopeless. Mm-hmm. We've inherited that. Yeah. Um, my brother and I were going to a uh, settled folk gathering mm. recently, a couple of years ago. You ever been there, by the way? It's great. Uh, Mike yeah. Harden organised oh, it. Right. Uh, the Dunans were, so it would say, I won't go down and see a little bit. Stay overnight. So we're headed off to settle, right? Mm. And you sh- we should have turned off to go through Harrogate and then across and then the settle. So we ended up at uh, Weatherby thinking, why have we come here? <laughs> so we missed the turn off. Now, that, that's a standing joke now. Yeah. So if my brother's going anywhere, are you going via Weatherby? No. <laughs> so that's going to that's gonna last. Oh, that's classic. So, but we, we kind of uh, used to get about in this motorbike and sidecar uh, yeah. as much as we could. Because I remember the image, man hanging on tight, on the pillion, daddy driving, and the two younger ones behind me, and me in front. And one incident in particular, Jude, mm-hmm. I'll never forget. Uh, because I was the eldest and therefore responsible, and, you know, I should have detected my brother taking his shoes off and throwing them out the top <laughs> of the <laughs> sad car, right? I should have had eyes in the back of my head and was able to see this. So... I got told off for him throwing his shoes out of me. So I had to go retrace our steps, try to find these shoes. Because we didn't have a lot of money and mm. shoes were shoes. So there you go. Mm. So I've never let him forgive that. Me baby brother. Yeah. That's so interesting though, isn't it? Because now, if something like that had happened, yes, the kids would probably still get a telly off. But they'd just go and buy a pair of shoes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you see, uh, you know, I had holes in my jeans when it wasn't fashionable uh-huh. you know because yeah. money was tight mm-hmm. you know in a, in a mining household all right my dad was a, a fitter mm-hmm. um, and you got certain perks of the job like free cool and, and all that kind of thing but we you would never describe us as being like wealthy mm-hmm. it just worked I mean we survived and what's happening here and did okay and had had a holiday but it was you know in a caravan site like that, I think first time we went abroad, we we always say it was in Eyemouth. <laughs> <laughs> first jaunt abroad, Eyemouth. Over the tweed. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but happy days. That's it. That's happy great. days. Because to be honest with you, in the village, everybody was the same. Mm-hmm. No, nobody had a car, nobody had out, really. Mm-hmm. You were all in the same boat when the mine was there. Yeah. And then things changed, obviously. Were there any deputies living there? Or was that Not where I was. Yeah. It was uh, it was a street of four houses. Mm-hmm. And my dad used to tell us that it it was it was an 18th century stone-built house, which I've got a picture of because it's on the Beamish uh, photo archive. Um, and I use it when I'm doing mining stuff for the children because I've now got on a PowerPoint where I showed them the school I went to in 1904. 
and you haven't got a road, you've got the wagon way. Mm-hmm. So they would take the wagons from Kosher Pit uh, because you, on the image you can see St. George's Church, which is still there on Bone Mill Lane. Mm-hmm. So you see the wagon way, and Dad told us that the keel boats would tie up near where the house was to get the coal from the wagon way and then take it down to Sunderland for the, the colliers, the steamers, mm-hmm. to take it to London. That's the way it worked, you know. Uh, and he reckoned that that row of four houses had been involved in that kind of thing, you know. Mm-hmm. So it, it was, I don't know, it, there's a lot of a lot of interesting stories in that place. Because when we were kids, mm-hmm. we used to go and play on something called the water banks or the water banks, where the weir kind of leveled out, it was shallow, and you had sandy banks, and we played there. And on the other side of the river, you had Lord Lampton's shooting parties, right? Shooting pheasants. So all his guests would come up, and we would regularly hear the guns and see them. Wow. And now and again, you'd have a pheasant walking down the back street outside our back door. Not for long. <laughs> <laughs> and we used to we used to actually harvest yeah. pheasant eggs and things like that, because on our side of the river, you had fields and what have you. And partridges and pheasants would nest there. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a real occurrence, you know, that mm-hmm. pheasant sex. Did people run into trouble with the gamekeeper ever? No, because we were on the other side Sad. of the river. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Occasionally you would get a, a, a an injured pheasant would mm-hmm. make it across, you know, being shot on the other side. But on the other side of the river was Lampton's land uh, exclusively. Mm-hmm. And the shooting parties would operate there. Brilliant. Yeah. And the wagon way took us up to the woods there where you would get your conkers because you could play conkers and, and that was a big thing, that, playing conkers. Yeah. Yeah. And again, seasonal. Of course, yeah. marbles. We played marbles. Yeah. Um, one of the funniest things that ever happened was uh-huh. we were in Liverpool and can you remember Call My Bluff? Oh, yes. The programme. Uh-huh. So they give you a word. Mm-hmm. And there would be three explanations or four explanations, and you had to choose which one was Mm -hmm. the accurate one. Well, my wife and I were watching, and I was in Liverpool, and the word fullican came up, right? F-U-L-L-I-C-K-I-N, fullican. And I went, I know what that is. And uh, (laughs) Janice, my wife, went, give up, because, you know, Mm -hmm. I said, I'm telling you, I know what that means. And it's a County Durham word for cheating at marbles. There you go. So when you play a marble, you're supposed to flick the marble with your thumb. Well, Fullerton is pushing it. So guiding it rather than flicking it. And it's true. So I went, see? And there's a big marble here. Is it a pet? Is it a panker? Is You've it a liggy? Liggies and pankers were, I think the panker was the smaller one of it. I'm not sure. Right. I, I, I'm not an expert on marbles. I played it. Yeah. Um, and I, I loved it, you know. When you sing the song, which is Geordie Lost? He's panker. Yeah, I say panker as well. Grandma used to yeah. sing that, yeah. yeah. More Geordie's Lost. You know, Len, uh-huh. that was one of his songs. Well, Geordie's Lost His Panker. Yeah. Uh-huh. And it still goes down well. People yeah. like to hear it, you know. Mm-hmm. I think uh, I was talking to my brother the other day we, we were going to the art centre mm-hmm. and we went down to where we used to live mm-hmm. and it was it was quite emotional and I said you know it was such a happy time because it was mm-hmm. it was great there was there were no worries then you know mm-hmm. uh, we just went out and played and there mm-hmm. were no cars you didn't have to worry about that and it was the fields the burn everywhere the hill worm hill Great, great place to be a kid. It's fascinating. Mm. It's brilliant. I think we've covered an awful lot of the questions that I was going to ask. Are there any that I should have asked? No, no. I mean, in terms of my upbringing, um, my my childhood, my education here, I think we've covered everything that that kind of shaped me. I mean, obviously, the three tons became a huge part of my life mm-hmm. towards the end of my teens where the Bertie Folk Club resided for many, many years. And in terms of my musical influence, I saw people there who 
just inspired me, um, particularly uh, Finbar and Eddie Fury. I mm. developed my love of traditional Irish music by seeing them play and hearing the alien pipes for the first time. That yeah. kind of knock me out. And uh, I've still, I've got a lifelong love of traditional Irish music. Mm-hmm. I love it. Been to Ireland many times to hear it uh, and see it in festivals and what have you. And obviously the Doolan family are huge family friends. Uh, and I, I love that kind of music. The, I think this is a really interesting interview, you know, because an awful lot of the time when we're talking about Washington memories, the, the memories tend to be contained within Washington. Mm. Whereas yours just by nature of playing football and uh, making music and everything, you've, you've always sort of ended up looking out. And mm. that's quite interesting. Well, I have to say as well, I have mm-hmm. to say, the Davy Lamb Folk Club was a huge part mm. of my life, the family's mm. life. Regular attenders, regular performers mm. there. And Terry and Eric Freeman and Frankie mm. have a huge fondness for it because that, that club was a brilliant place to be. Mm. Uh, Saturday nights were special there. It's just fabulous nights. Mm. I mean, the residents themselves could put on a fantastic night with some of the guests there as well. Just a wonderful experience, you know, the friendliness, the banter. The banter was something else. <clears throat> I've heard many interesting bit of banter coming from uh, various parts of our family. Um, but it was just great, mm-hmm. just a great experience. So I'm very grateful for Terry and Co for making that happen because it was a brilliant place to be. And that started with the art centre, didn't it? It wasn't No, really I think it started elsewhere, right. dude. I, I'm mm-hmm. not an expert on the uh, the Davy Lamp, but I, I think they, they had a, a kind of gathering. might not have been called uh, the Davy Lamp. The, the Davy Lamp title might be the art centre, as you say. Mm-hmm. But I think they used to meet uh, at a different place. But that name, yes, I think mm-hmm. you're right. I think it, it was the formal name given to that the night there. But uh, when you look at the original residence, I mean, well, Bob Fox, you know, Barry Dipper, Terry and Eric Freeman, Frankie, wow. Well, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, when they put their festivals on and special nights, I mean, kosher banner nights, they were, they were fantastic nights. I've, mm-hmm. I've got incredible memories of that place. Ocean Banner Nights. Yeah, well, they had, the, you can see them on YouTube, the, they had the banner unfurled at the back of the stage. Uh, myself, me, Auntie Doreen, uh, my Uncle Brian, 2015 was the first mm-hmm. one. Um, Johnny Handel, Benny Graham, Ed Pickford, uh, Terry and Eric Freeman, they, uh, they put on this special night where it was all related to the banner. Ah, so this is after, uh, that's something else that uh, people listening won't know, is that the kosher banner was redesigned to uh, to reflect your granddad yeah. and Jock Purden. Jock Purden, they're featured on, on one side of it, yes. Mm-hmm. And that banner now is proudly hanging in Rickleton Primary School, mm-hmm. where it's been for nearly two years now, uh, which happens to be right where Harrod and Connery was. Amazing. That is amazing. Because when I took it into the school and the children were all, every single child in the school was in the hall when I introduced the banner to them and said, you know, this is my grandfather and he used to be a miner and guess where he used to work? Right underneath where he all sat. And it was like, wow. And that's the way it was introduced to me. And I did a week's workshops in the school, every single child, from the littlest to the eldest. I did a workshop about mining life, uh, the significance of it in the area where they're from, all that kind of thing. And it, it's still hanging there because it had to be taken out of Red Hills when it was closed. And I wanted to know exactly where it was. And rather than have it in the Brothers Loft, which was the alternative, mm-hmm. I went to see Mr. Baker from the school and said, look, this is the situation. Would you be interested in having the banner? And they said, yes. And to their credit, they not only just received the banner, they collapsed the timetable for a week and did a, and a, did a huge, 
huge project about mm. heart and colliery and mining and the people of Fatfield because it didn't just reference uh, the miners. They, they had uh, people like uh, Gordon Hughes, who played football for Newcastle, who was my dad's apprentice. Uh, Bobby Thompson mm-hmm. worked at Harrow. Well, turned up. Not sure he did. <laughs> 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 so you know they, yeah. they looked at uh, Washington or, or Harrow and Fatfield, key people from that area. So yeah, uh, it's still there, and it will be there until hopefully it goes back into Rittles in the Pippins Pond. That's brilliant. Thank you, Bill. My pleasure, Jude. Yeah. My pleasure.